champion the political science and government documents librarian and coordinator of the House of Learning Lecture Series. We welcome students, colleagues, faculty, and invited guests here today to hear Professor Matthew J. Grow from the Department of History at the University of Southern Indiana deliver an address entitled Thomas L. Kane and 19th Century Mormons. The library sponsors two main lectures and lecture series, the House of Learning Lectures and the Alice Louise Reynolds Women in Scholarship Lecture. Through these lectures, the library brings together scholars and students to engage in a civil discussion of ideas. And in so doing, the library contributes to building a learned community which fosters the faithful life of the mind. The House of Learning Lectures series title is taken from the 88th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, verse 119, where the Lord instructs the saints to prepare every needful thing, even a house of learning. Because the library is the campus repository for the literature of all academic disciplines and scholarship, the library is well positioned to be considered BYU's house of learning. The Harold B. Lee Library takes seriously its campus role as the intellectual heart of inquiry and knowledge and is honored to provide this house of learning lecture today. Introducing today's speaker is Dr. David Whitaker, curator of the 19th century Western and Mormon Americana collection in the L. Tom Perry Special Collections Library. I'd like to add my uh, inter uh, welcome to you and uh, suggest that uh, along with this House of Learning, this uh, completes our uh, Thomas L. Cain lecture series. Uh, this is the seventh and final series uh, that we've held uh, to complement our Cain exhibit in Special Collections, which opened in November of 2008 and will continue until June uh, of this year. We hope that you will take time following the lecture today to visit our Cain exhibit just around the corner in Special Collections. In addition to the general support uh, general support and university librarian, uh, Randy Olson, and the Lee Library Administration. These lectures are being co-sponsored by uh, John Welch and his staff at BYU Studies, and we are very grateful for their support. Uh, it is currently planned that all these lectures will appear in book form uh, this fall. My name is David Whitaker, as Brian has indicated, and uh, I've been sort of coordinating the lectures as well as the exhibit. Thomas L. Cain, or the subject of our exhibit and lectures, was a non-Mormon friend of the Latter-day Saints in the 19th century. His father, John K. Cain, was a close friend of several United States presidents, one of whom, James K. Polk, appointed him to the federal bench in Philadelphia. His son, Thomas, was also trained in the law, but was motivated while young to engage more fully in social and cultural causes. In 1846, Thomas read accounts in the Philadelphia newspapers of the exile plight of the Mormons who had been driven from their homes in western Illinois and who were then scattered across Iowa and uh, west to the Missouri River Valley where they were in the process of establishing their winter quarters. Using his father's connections, Thomas arranged to both investigate the intentions of the Mormons in their western pilgrimage and also help apply U.S. federal assistance to these exiled people. Cain would spend his life defending the Mormons and the subject of our lectures to this point have focused on various aspects of Cain's relationship with the Latter-day Saints. Uh, Cain, of course, uh, began his relationship in 1846 with the Mormons, and it lasted until his own death in 1883. But today, we've asked Matt Groh to cast the net further out.
to look at Kane's life on a broader American canvas. Matt, of course, is uh, not a stranger to BYU, having done earlier undergraduate work here at BYU. He received his PhD in history from the University of Notre Dame in 2006, studying under the direction of Professor George Marston uh, at Notre Dame. Matt is currently an assistant professor uh, of history at the University of Southern Indiana, where he also serves as a director of communal studies there. He has published a number of articles on Kane and has at least two uh, additional books in the works. One uh, collection of material from the Kane uh, collection manuscripts and another a co-authored autobiography uh, of Parley P. Pratt, his ancestor. We look forward to both of those volumes. His dissertation, of course, at Notre Dame was on Thomas Kane, and his revised form has just been published by Yale University Press, a major, major study of the man whom we've been talking about in this lecture series and uh, for whom we focused, uh, or about whom we focused in our exhibit. We have arranged following uh, this presentation and the question and answer period to have books available for uh, autographing by, uh, purchasing and autographing by Matt uh, out in the foyer just before you enter the auditorium. We hope you'll uh, join us for that following this presentation. His presentation today will broaden the scope of our previous presentations. While Cain is remembered in Mormon country as a 19th century defender of the Latter-day Saints, he also distinguished himself as a Civil War officer, as a crusader for anti-slavery, women's rights, educational reform, and general concern for the downtrodden. And certainly his concern for the Mormons fits nicely within that broader interest. His activities, as Matt shows uh, in a very beautiful way in his new biography, uh, it illuminates the connections in the 19th century between partisan politics, religion, and social reform by demonstrating how Cain and like-minded others fused democratic party ideology, anti-evangelism, and romanticism into a broad agenda of reform. Uh, I think you'll be well rewarded uh, for pursuing Matt's important biography. Let's uh, welcome Matt Groh, uh, uh, who will address the topic, Thomas L. Cain and 19th Century America. Matt. Well, thank you, David, for that kind introduction. On May, the, on May 13, 1846, the very day the United States declared war on Mexico, a slight, wiry, upper-class 24-year-old entered a Mormon church conference in Philadelphia. Thomas L. Cain, as David indicated, had not stumbled upon the meeting by chance. He had read of the Mormons' forced eviction from Nauvoo and decided that a relationship with the Latter-day Saints would be mutually advantageous. The mid-1840s were a particularly promising moment for a would-be humanitarian with a healthy streak of iconoclasm to join up with the Latter-day Saints. The Mormon refugee camps in Iowa, lacking adequate supplies, subject to ep epidemic diseases, and plagued by fears of future persecution, presented a humanitarian crisis which piqued Cain's sensibilities. He planned to visit the camps, use the government connections of his father to raise a battalion of Mormon soldiers for the Mexican War, and accompany the saints to California, which he assumed was their destination. Cain's initial scheme mixed personal ambition with humanitarian sentiment. Spending time with the Mormons, he wrote, would expose him to a, a Yankee and fanatic people and allow him to write a little book that would pay. Besides, do write to what I am high convinced are a wrong tribe of men. Fueled by the political connections of his powerful father, he dreamed large. An expedition with the Mormons would allow him to be on the ground in California in case of a, re of a revolt against Mexican rule. He could help fill the void in American leadership in such a case, and perhaps even be the first US governor. In short, he hoped to help the Mormons to my utmost principally, but also to, see, to help myself if I see anything outstanding. His family, however, saw only potential ruin in, in involvement with such a disreputable cause. Cain's plan was the veriest hallucination that ever afflicted an educated mind, his father said. He would deal a blow to his own character as a right-minded man, which he will feel through life. His brother obliquely referred to another Cain family concern, worrying that his brother would go to the camps as Elder Cain. Indeed, rumors dog came throughout his life that he worked as a secret Mormon convert, not as a disinterested reformer. 
Cain spent the summer of 1846 in the Mormon camps. Here is a uh, drawing from his notebook of the camps. Intimate association convinced him that the Mormons were sincere and increased his resolve to champion their cause. The Mormons, recognizing the value of such a well-connected individual, treated Cain as royalty. When he spoke in public, the applause was positively deafening. Cain told his parents he was idolized by my good friends. After he, filled, after he fell gravely ill at the camps, Mormon nursing cemented his loyalty. Rather than a temporary partnership, he began to envision a long-term relationship with the saints, with himself as their self-appointed defender to the nation. He would speak for them, to tell the world and the people of the Union who these are who have been chased from hearth and home from the bosoms of their friends and the graveyards of their parents. Before he left the Mormon camps, Cain asked for and received a patriarchal blessing, a ritual normally available only to church members. Patriarch John Smith, an uncle of Joseph Smith, laid his hands on the head of Brother Thomas and informed Cain that angels had already defended him and promised future protection. For thou art called to do a great work on the earth. To the surprise of Cain, a sickly bachelor, Patriarch Smith promised that he would marry and raise up sons and daughters that shall be esteemed as the excellent of the earth. Furthermore, Smith told Cain, thy name shall be had in honorable remembrance among the saints to all generations. As Cain defended the saints for nearly the next four decades, Mormon leaders continually reiterated this final promise. In 1847, Apostle Willard Richards rejoiced that there is one master spirit one noble soul inspired by heaven in the 19th century who wills that truth shall flow forth concerning an oppressed and a suffering people. Mormons renamed their principal town in Iowa as Canesville. Following the publication of Cain's influential 1850 pamphlet, The Mormons, Apostle Orson Hyde told them the pamphlet will forever immortalize your name on the records and in the memory of the saints. When Cain arrived in Salt Lake City in 1857 to mediate the Utah War, Brigham Young told him, Brother Thomas, the Lord sent you here, and he will not let you die. I want to have your name live with the saints to all eternity. You have done a great work, and you will do a greater work still. The saints had little doubt of Cain's divinely appointed role as their defender. Wilfred Woodruff told them, The name of Colonel Thomas L. Cain stands most prominent, not only as a philanthropist and one that made superhuman exertions, to dam up and roll back a mighty flood of wrath, indignation, and persecution, but as an instrument in the hands of God and inspired by him. In 1864, the saints named a, a county in southern Utah after Cain. 19th century Mormons tended to see the world in dichotomies, good and evil, pure and corrupt, saint and Gentile. Cain was a reminder that not everyone could be placed into the simple categories. To the 19th century Mormon mind, he was proof that God occasionally used outsiders, or Gentiles as they would have said, to protect Zion and further his work. In the 125 years since Cain's death, Mormon leaders have returned to their promise to remember their 19th century champion. In 1939, church president Heber J. Grant welcomed a grandson of Thomas Cain, E. Kent Cain, in Utah, and together they recreated the journey made by Thomas and his wife Elizabeth in 1872 from Salt Lake City to, to St. George, which Elizabeth Cain memorialized in a classic book, 12 Mormon Homes. In the 1940s, church president George Albert Smith encouraged E. Kent Cain to collaborate on a biography of his grandfather with a, another Mormon leader. Smith, President Smith instructed, I feel the church should rise to its duty and its opportunity to recognize the sacrifices, the devotion, and the great achievements of our distinguished friend who so valiantly served us in our times of greatest need. While in Utah, E. Kent Cain went to general conference. He was surprised when President George Albert Smith invited him up to the pulpit as a very rare non-Mormon speaker in general conference. The book, though worked on intermittently for decades, was never finished. In the 1950s, a Utah philanthropist named Nicholas Morgan commissioned a statue of Cain, memorializing him as a friend of the Mormons and placed in the Utah State Capitol. In the early 1970s, again to remember Cain, the Latter-day Saints bought a chapel in Cain, Pennsylvania. This is a, that, that Cain had constructed 
uh, in the late 1870s and where he is buried. This is a photo of, of uh, a reunion of Kane's Civil War soldiers at the chapel after Kane died. Here's what it looks like today. The, the intent of purchasing the Kane Chapel was again to remember Kane, and, and, and Kane's descendants uh, wrote in the local newspaper, the Kane Republican, that Kane is a, far, is a man far better known and honored in Utah today than here in Kane, Pennsylvania. Since then, the chapel has been used as a Mormon meeting house and as a historical site lauding Kane's service to the church. But probably the most significant effort to remember Cain among the Latter-day Saints has occurred over the past couple of decades, almost three decades now, as Brigham Young University, under the leadership of David Whitaker, has purchased thousands of Cain's do of Cain documents which have been preserved in his family since his death. Not only did BYU purchase this collection, they made an item by item register, something tremendously unusual in archival management today that runs to over 1,200 Pages. Truly a tremendous effort. The Kane collection at BYU will ensure that Thomas L. Kane will continue be, to be studied for generations. So it's altogether fitting that BYU sponsor uh, an exhibit and a lecture series on Kane, both to pay tribute to him and to highlight uh, this extraordinary Kane collection. But my job here today, as uh, was indicated, is not to discuss Kane's place in Mormon memory but to place Cain in 19th century America. For the past five years, my attempts to understand Cain have taken me to archives from New Hampshire to Utah, and I've traced his steps in his native Philadelphia, his beloved Allegheny Mountains of Western Pennsylvania, and to Utah, where he visited on three significant occasions. Besides the rich resources at BYU, important Cain collections exist uh, at the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia, at Yale, at Stanford, at the University of Michigan. All told, there are thousands and thousands of documents. The sources, however, were not without their limitations and problems. In the front of her very rich Civil War journal, Elizabeth Kane wrote, to be burned, unread if I die, unless Tom cares to read it. No one else. Mind, I will haunt anyone who does. <laughs> Unfortunately for me, I spent a night at the Kane Bed and Breakfast, which is the Kane Mansion in Kane, Pennsylvania. This is how it looked when Thomas was alive, but it burned down, and Elizabeth built a larger house, which I was informed the night after I'd spent there that local lore holds is indeed haunted. The sheer volume of Kane's sources and the range of Kane's interests made the search uh, for thematic unity difficult. Kane agitated to end the death penalty for peace, for women's rights, to establish inner city schools for, for poor children, against slavery, and on behalf of the religious liberty of religious minorities. Besides a reformer, he was a law clerk, a lawyer, a Civil War general, and a large-scale land developer. Diversity of action wasn't the only problem. Indeed, any life worth, worth writing about probably presents similar difficulties. Cain was also a man of both apparent and real contrasts and paradoxes. He was a peacemaker who became a general, an anti-slavery crusader who longed for the chivalrous world of the antebellum South, a cosmopolitan gentleman who spent his last 25 years in the rustic Alleghenies a Jacksonian Democrat who became a free soiler and then a Republican, a devout Presbyterian who gravitated towards Ogos Comte's religion of humanity and atheism before settling on an anti-denominational Christianity, an abolitionist who profoundly feared racial mixing, a diminutive, fragile, often depressed, and according to his contemporaries, feminine-looking man with a pattern of aggressively masculine actions. After I presented a paper on Cain at the American Society for Church History, the commentator called Cain inconsistent to the point of contradiction, eclectic, idiosyncratic, enigmatic, and paradoxical. I could only agree. And yet, there is an underlying unity to Cain's actions which can illuminate like-minded social reformers who were historically important but have been largely dismissed by the past generation of historians. 
Few topics in American history have attracted as much attention as the social reform mo movements in the decades before the Civil War. In 1841, Ralph Waldo Emerson captured the spirit of the times. In the history of the world, the doctrine of reform has never had such scope as at the present hour, as reformers sought to improve Christianity, the laws, commerce, school, the farms, the laboratory. Like many of his contemporaries in Emerson's words, Cain felt the call to cast aside all evil customs, timidities, and limitations, and to be in his place a free and helpful man, a reformer. In Emerson's romantic view, a reformer would face the world as a brave and upright man who would stand against injustices and find or cut a straight path to everything excellent in the earth and not only go honorably himself, but make it easier for all who follow him. Most histories of 19th century reform locate the roots of the reforming spirit in the synthesis of evangelical religion and Whig party politics. Evangelical Protestants who emphasized the duty of Christians to engage actively in society through both revivals and social reform were the religious and cultural mainstream of American life in these decades. Hoping to perfect individuals and create a Christian nation, they created a benevolent empire of reforming institutions which were particularly influential in New England and among New England immigrants in New York and the Midwest. They generally voted Whig and shared that party's distrust of cultural and religious diversity as well as its deference to elites. Cain represented a very different type of reformer. In short, he was a Democrat, not a Whig, and he despised evangelicalism. Though often presented as the party of slaveholders and intensely hostile to reform, the antebellum Democratic Party actually had a significant reform wing, driven by the party's egalitarian impulses and more inclusive vision of American religious and ethnic pluralism. Romanticism also profoundly shaped the ethos of these reformers. The emphasis placed by Jacksonian Democrats on liberty corresponded with Romanticism's emphasis on the individual and its belief in the perfectibility of man. Romantics also often distrusted traditional religion, though they generally retained a religious sens sensibility and longed for spirituality. A, ro a romantic impulse impelled these reformers to sympathize with those on the margins of society and to declare war on, hum on human suffering and poverty. An obituary from which I've taken the title of my book labeled Cain's philosophy as liberty to the downtrodden. These reformers, like Cain, positioned themselves against both mainstream evangelicalism and the evangelical reformers of the benevolent empire. Arguably, reformers like Cain contributed as much, if not more, to 19th century reform as did their Whig evangelical counterparts. Raised in a wealthy and socially prominent Philadelphia family, Cain wrote that he had been born with the gold spoon in my mouth to station and influence and responsibility, which required him to be an earnest missionary of truth and progress and reform. His mother, Jane Duval Leeper Cain, came from a politically powerful Philadelphia family, and his father, John K. Cain, became a nationally known Democratic Party insider and a prominent federal judge. His connections with uh, Democratic presidents James Polk and James Buchanan would open the White House doors to his son, enabling him to raise the Mormon battalion and mediate the Utah War. Thomas's talented older brother, Elisha, uh, on my right, overshadowed Thomas during his decade. He's the older brother. And, he, and Elisha became an internationally known Arctic explorer before dying at a tragically young age. Thomas described Elisha as one who spends his life doing the fine, brave thing that ladies love and men envy. Here's another picture of Elisha in his military uniform. Like many of his counterparts, Cain viewed reform in a transatlantic context. As a young man in the early 1840s, he took two extensive trips to England and France, 
during his Parisian adventures, Cain met and became a sometime disciple of the philosopher Auguste Comte, the father of positivism, whose vision of a religion of humanity fueled Cain's humanitarian drive and his religious unorthodoxy. His time in Europe improved Cain's perpetually fragile health and led to new resolve. His former deficiency of vitality, he admitted, had led to both blind fatalism and laziness. Such as I am, you will find me active, a doing person, he pledged to his father. He tried to assure his mother that time in France had converted him to a wholesome conservatism of ideas. He would not come back to you as a destructive, a radical, but rather a lover of the respectabilities, an abhorrer of social changes. Cain's future wife more correctly diagnosed his attitude, suggesting that he had told his mother what she wished to hear. Upon his return, Elizabeth wrote, he threw himself with youthful fervor into numerous reform movements, of which the general drift was an introduction of advanced French politics into America. Events soon after his reform, uh, soon after his return from Europe, as well as family influences, solidified Cain's reform trajectory. His father, John Cain, was a staunch Presbyterian, deeply suspicious of evangelical reformers as well. He was further a diehard Democrat and a Mason in a day when most evangelicals supported Whigs and anti-Masons. Soon after his son's return from Paris, John Cain criticized the fanaticism of evangelical reformers, which, has, which have nearly run themselves out of breath on abolition and temperance, and now they have taken hold of the Bible. A controversy over Catholic objections to the reading of the Protestant Bible in, in, the street, in, in, in Philadelphia public schools led to the formation of a nativist political party and riots in the streets of Philadelphia between nativists and Catholics. As a member of a local militia, Tom stood sentinel with a musket for four nights to help end the riots. Both Keynes blamed the riots on the evangelical clergy. Thomas satirically described a conversation he had with St. Cornelius, the Reverend Cornelius C. Coulier, the Keynes pastor who was active in this anti-Catholic movement. Thomas Kane recorded the denial by the profound theologian of a religiously diverse society. Coulier said, no church ought to exist contrary to the wishes of the great part of the population of a country or to the sense of a community opposed to its tenets. Thomas noted that Coulier, a man active in sending missionaries among all manners of heathen majorities, failed to see the irony. For Thomas, the riots confirmed both his distrust of evangelicals and his commitment to religious minorities. His own religious unorthodoxy also enabled this commitment to radical reform. As a young man, Cain even had designs to create a religion suited to the 19th century, a religion containing in itself slaves, women, industrial classes, finally a religion of movement. He, however, lost his noble aspirations and burned his religious writings. While in France, he also lost most of his uh, childhood religion. He wrote home to his mother, mocking the long list of frequently condemned evangelical vices. He promised, I'll not drink juleps or cocktails, nor cobblers, nor go to horse races, cocktails or theaters, nor keep a setter dog, sulky or trotter, or mistress, nor chew tobacco, smoke or snuff, nor play tarot cards or billiards, nor marry a chambermaid. Indeed, Cain Wright rising to he wrote, rising to his own rhetoric, I will try to be a good child. And a comfort and not a torment to you and Papa, and possibly even go to church every Sunday and say the sermon was good by pious falsehood and the long prayer was not long. <laughs> Through most of the 1840s and 1850s, his personal religion blended uh, Ogles Comte's religion of humanity with Christian asceticism. As he told his fiancée, he hoped her religion would not be confined within four walls, but within the mighty congregation of humanity. Cain also continually derided both evangelical religion and evangelical reform. One Sunday, he heard, he heard a dreadful noise, which turned out to be one of the Methodist meeting houses where the law permits wicked people to make lunatics nearly as fast as the hospitals can cure them. Amidst his personal religious journey, Cain plunged into reform. He began with capital punishment, joining an organization committed to the end of the death penalty. Joining the crusade against the death penalty gave Cain an important entree into the world 
of reformers. Horace Greeley, for instance, uh, another advocate against the death pen penalty, became his lifelong friend and ally. Cain also became uh, involved in the allied projects of prison reform and peace. For Cain, genuine reform sentiment and personal ambition were not mutually exclusive. While at the Mormon camps in 1846, he instructed his parents, if you haven't resigned my place with the anti-capital punishment men, keep it for me, as my life, whether of one kind or another, must begin when I get into Philadelphia this time. Nor was Cain a purist who refused to alter his beliefs. In December 1846, as Thomas jockeyed for an army commission in the Mexican-American War, John Cain wrote Elisha, would you ever believe it? Your philanthropist, philosopher, anti-war, anti-capital punishment brother, who denies the right of man to take life even for crime, Tom, even Tom Cain, is rabid for a chance of shooting Mexicans. Like many reformers, Cain turned in instinctively to newspapers and pamphlets to promote his unpopular causes. He formed a club of young men who would place anonymous articles advocating their causes in the newspapers. And indeed, he used a wide variety of methods to, in his words, manufacture public opinion. For instance, he fabricated and then planted in newspapers letters. He wrote public letters to leading politicians, which were widely reprinted. He held well-publicized fundraising meetings for his various causes. And he ghost wrote newspaper articles, even quoting himself sometimes. In the late 1840s, Cain became enthralled with a new reform, the restriction of slavery. In 1848, he became the Pennsylvania chairman of the, of the Pennsylvania Free Soil Committee. The Free Soilers arose during the 1848 presidential campaign, intent to halt the spread of slavery into the territories acquired in the Mexican-American War. The bulk of the Free Soilers, like Cain, were dissident Democrats, disaffected with their party's increasingly fervent defense of slavery. As the Free Soil Movement fizzled, Cain returned to the Democratic Party, but continued to agitate for abolitionism. Cain, like most abolitionists, was no racial egalitarian. Rather, he worried intensely about the destructive effects of intermarriage on whites. Most Democratic anti-slavery activists, like Cain, eventually became Republicans. Uh, they contributed much to the anti-slavery movement, battling the slave powers, they called it, from a distinct perspective, which used the language of Jacksonian democracy and the desire to protect the racial purity of the Western territories uh, as their key arguments. In 1850, the nation passed a fugitive slave law, which set in place a legal mechanism to return escaped slaves in the north to the south. It forced Northerners, particularly United States commissioners, to actively participate in returning the escaped slaves. In October 1850, Kane, then 28 years old and a U.S. commissioner, entered the federal courtroom in Philadelphia's Independence Hall where he was a law clerk for his father. In a letter denouncing the fugitive slave law to his father, he noisily resigned his lucrative position as United States commissioner. His act struck a raw national nerve. To his sister, Cain wrote, I have received another complimentary newspaper from the South in which, with reference to our father's pro-slavery Democratic Party, I am called a renegade to my parents' faith. By contrast, the Pennsylvania Freeman, an abolitionist newspaper, predicted that, is, that his resignation would be honored by every man who can appreciate a noble deed. That apparently did not include Judge John Cain who ruled his son's letter to be in contempt of court and sent him to prison. Fortunately for Thomas, an associate justice of the United States Supreme Court overruled his conviction. Thomas's high-profile resignation earned him the respect and attention of national abolitionists. Their praise fed his sense of self as a defender of the downtrodden and a romantic martyr for conscience sake. Cain continued as his father's clerk, even as Judge Cain's courtroom became an intensely uh, heated arena of, of fugitive slave trials. And indeed, he continued to publicly support uh, many of these fugitives and privately participate in the Underground Railroad. Kane's marriage to his talented 16-year-old second cousin, Elizabeth Wood, in 1853, also influenced his reform involvement. Thomas envisioned their marriage as an alliance of reformers in which he would train his wife to become a leading exponent of women's rights. 
Thomas served as a corporator, or the member of the Board of Trustees, of the pioneering Philadelphia-based female medical college, supported Elizabeth's attendance there to help the college by the influence of her social position. Thomas also encouraged his wife to become an author to press women's rights issues through her writing. Elizabeth recalled that her husband was for the rights of man, but woman first. Together, they envisioned a society based on gender equality and sought to advance women's education and to reform the institution of marriage itself. Elizabeth also joined her husband in his battles against urban poverty. As Thomas founded and financed a school for Philadelphia's poor children uh, modeled on uh, the French infant schools, and he served as a local leader for the House of Refuge movement, which sought to reform and, and give job training to juvenile delinquents. Elizabeth's influence also brought Thomas back closer to Orthodox Christianity, helping lead to Thomas's uh, conversion to a, a non-denominational Christianity. Throughout this period, Thomas engaged in one more area of reform, defense of the Latter-day Saints. Cain's relationship with the Mormons has been well covered in this series, including his key role in raising the Mormon battalion, his defense of the, the, the Latter-day Saints in the press and the halls of Congress, and his mediation of the Utah War. Significantly for this institution, in the 1870s, Cain urged Mormon leaders to inaugurate a system of education informed by your own experience of the world, rather than send your bright youths abroad to lay the basis of the opinions of their lives on the crumbling foundations of modern unfaith and specialism. Indeed, he hoped the saints would be educated at home, free from evil and corrupting influences and examples where faith in God and virtue and, pur and purity can be preserved. Cain's vision corresponded with Brigham Young's own views, and in the 1870s, Cain helped prepare legal documents for the college which became this university. Cain's reform, mo reform motivations and activities clarify why he defended the Mormons. Latter-day Saints have long been puzzled by Cain's actions. He experienced a range of motivations, adventure, honor, fame, sibling rivalry, friendship. Reform, however, was paramount. Anti-evangelicalism was particularly crucial uh, to his defense of the Latter-day Saints as was his democratic ideology of liberty and his own religious unorthodoxy, which enabled him to find value in Latter-day Latter Saint religion and to serve as their reformer. And indeed, Cain's uh, reform career and tactics uh, proved tremendously illuminating to understand how he defended the Latter-day Saints in the press uh, and also why he was able to have the political power to uh, mediate uh, the Utah War. This is a picture of uh, Thomas Cain about the time of the Utah War crisis in 1857-58. As with no other event in his life, Cain shaped events of national importance during the Utah War era. When he came to Utah, he mediated uh, a peace between the uh, newly appointed governor to Utah, Alfred Cumming, and the Mormons. His intervention relied on his previous career in democratic anti-evangelical reform. He viewed the Utah War as a holy war, propelled in large part by the culture of evangelicalism. This shaped his sense of mission as he sought to protect the religious liberty of the Latter-day Saints. His status as a Democratic Party insider gave him sufficient credibility to win Buchanan's cautious assent to his proposal. Cain also used his Democratic connections to shape perceptions of the war and policies toward the Mormons in the post-war era. A romantic sense of standing between a downtrodden people and an army, in his eyes bent on persecution, also impelled Cain. Besides his involvement in reform, Cain's life is also important because it gives us insight into two other cultural types in the 19th century, the romantic hero and the honorable gentleman. The romantic hero was an icon in both romantic literature and in the 19th century cultural imagination. The romantic hero exalted individuality, displayed unusual sensitivity to injustices, and had an iconoclastic personality which rejected commonly held social, political, and religious conventions. 
Likewise, Cain prided himself on standing against the crowd for righteous causes and on, on acting decisively and trusting his own conclusions rather than cultural norms and on undertaking dangerous and manly missions in defiance of his physical frailties. The romantic hero, like Cain, was an original who, in the words of Cain's friend, Ralph Waldo Emerson, marched to his own music. The ideal of the romantic hero shaped Cain's sense of manliness. Reform often carried an unmistakably feminine aura, both because of its support of women's rights and uh, because of the high profile of female reformers. The diminutive Cain, described as uncommonly small and feminine and as a little weak, boyish, sickly looking fellow by contemporaries, combated the image of the effeminate reformer with, with flamboyantly masculine ge gestures. At an 1850 abolitionist meeting in New York, he publicly threatened to kill a Tammany Hall captain with a well-earned reputation for violence who attempted to, to disrupt the meeting. An observer said, Colonel Kane, a slight and fearless youth, made the notorious leader of the Writers Club. I suspect there's a large amount of exaggeration that went into that statement. But the very act of reform, of standing forth for those who could not do so for themselves, was seen as a manly act, and Kane thrived on his own sense of standing against the crowd. He wrote, I have done a few manly deeds, and I have been abused for them. Should the cause of Mormonism become popular, Cain would no longer be useful to the saints, he said, as his place would always be in the ranks of the supporters of causes called desperate and at the head of the unthanked and unrewarded pioneers of unpopular reform. Cain's view of himself as a romantic hero closely relates to another cultural type, the, on, the man of honor, the chivalrous defender of the downtrodden. While historians have generally associated this culture of honor with the South, Cain's actions demonstrate that the culture of honor retained its influence in the sectional borderlands in places like Pennsylvania and among elite northerners like Cain. In addition for Cain, a man of honor, particularly one to, born to privilege like himself, defended those lower on the social scale. Cain's immersion in the culture of honor particularly shaped his Civil War career as he envisioned himself as, as a chivalrous knight in his Civil War battles. He threw his energies into the Civil War immediately after the firing on Fort Sumter in, 18, in April 1861. During the next two years before his re retirements caused by injuries, he raised one of the most storied regiments of the Union Army, the Pennsylvania Bucktails, challenged the superior officer to a duel, again, this theme of a man of honor being someone who challenges to duels, rose to the rank of Brigadier General, was seriously wounded in two battles, was taken prisoner of war, and played a key role at Gettysburg. This is a picture, a painting, uh, by a 19th century uh, painter uh, of the scene at Gettysburg. And in the lower left corner of the painting, you can see uh, an officer who's paint who is pointing his pistol not at the enemy, but at retreating soldiers, and that is Cain, because he had promised his soldiers if any of them fled the line, he would personally shoot them. I don't think he really shot anyone, but, 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 but that was a threat that Civil War officers had to use at times to keep their men in line. Cain's Civil War experience uh, really shows his ethic of honor, uh, both in his dual challenge uh, but also how he perceived himself and his troops, his uh, perceptions of legitimate actions, and his treatment, of and uh, his treatment of and reconciliation with his foes. This is a picture of Cain in the 1870s. Cain's experiences can thus illuminate both Latter-day Saint history and 19th century social reform and politics. During the antebellum era, reformers like Cain, drawn from the ranks of the Democratic Party, defined themselves against the evangelical culture of reform, and advocated a humanitarianism that sought to relieve human suffering. They generally exhibited a far greater openness to cultural, religious, and ethnic pluralism than did their Whig evangelical counterparts. Cain's own reform activities, including his defense of the Mormons, sprang from this culture. Thus, as a historical figure, Cain should not be seen merely as a friend of the Mormons, but as someone who can be used to illuminate 19th century culture and politics. Thank you. <laughs>